Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua with James Jacob Prash, live from Galilee. Jacob, we have a question. It's a common question or objection to the end of Mark's gospel. Many say that um, verses 9 through 20 of chapter 16 were added later and that those verses um, are effectively not canonical or, or shouldn't be there. Um, how do we deal with this objection? How did, it, how did it emerge? This is quite a situation. M much of the controversy concerning this passage emerged for reasons that had to do with Christians not wanting to be identified with something that was transpiring in Appalachia in the United States. Bear with me while I explain it. In the late 1700s, there was a massive immigration of people known as Scotch-Irish. They were Scots who lived in Northern Ireland, but came from Scotland. And with the decrofting in Scotland, and in the aftermath of the Jacobite Wars with England, they came to the United States via Philadelphia, at that time the main port. The Pocono Mountains of eastern Pennsylvania were too low. They were not high enough and didn't resemble the mountains they came from in the highlands of Scotland. So they crossed the Mason-Dixon line and went west to Appalachia in the area between present West Virginia and eastern Kentucky. Those mountains were approximately the same height as what they left in Scotland. And they brought their culture with them in many respects moonshine whiskey that was something that they bought with them they made whiskey in scotland and they made whiskey in in ireland with distilleries the clog dancing and the music um from which american bluegrass music emerges that originally came again from ireland and was bought by the scotch irish to the united states various other things associated with with their culture emerged First of all, they transplanted the political situation they left and their resentment of England to the New World. The Clyde River in Scotland separated the lowlands of Scotland from the highlands of Scotland. So the Shenandoah River separated West Virginia from Tidewater, Virginia. Tidewater, Virginia was seen as an economic colony of Great Britain because the cotton industry provided the raw materials for the British textile industry in the north of England and was associated with Great Britain and most of the money of the plantation owners was money that was held offshore in London. So they were seen as the English. The Scottish were the ones who fought the English. They were the Highlanders. And what the Clyde River was in Britain, the Shenandoah became. It got to the point where in the American Revolution, these people were extremely loyal to George Washington, using Indian tactics and fighting the British in the American Revolution when the British tried to invade Appalachia. It just didn't work. Um, George Washington understood this from his own experience when General Braddock was killed in the French and Indian War near Pittsburgh. The British tried to adopt European battlefield strategy to the New World, and it didn't work. The Native American Indians had a particular way of fighting that would resemble guerrilla warfare that was adopted by the settlers. And it went on and on like this. We couldn't beat the English in Scotland, but we can beat them in Virginia. That was the thinking of it. Well, it went on and on like this. In the American Civil War, West Virginia broke away from Tidewater, Virginia. Although it was geographically and culturally part of the South, they sided with the Union, with the Northern anti-slavery states. It was a very complicated situation, but to understand how this happened in the United States, you have to understand where these people came from and why. What took place in Scotland with the clans of Scotland were that people would marry within their clans. McDonald's would marry McDonald's, and McTavish's McTavish's, and McDougal's McDougal's. But there were no more organized clans in the United States 
So they married within families and inbreeding became a problem. The lack of genetic diversity began to produce congenital idiocy. When you have a lack of genetic diversity in a human gene pool, you're gonna have problems. One is a higher risk of hemophilia and the other is a high risk of genetically controlled low intelligence or genetically determined low intelligence. In Europe and in Britain, it was the blue bloods. The royal families would marry each other as a way to make treaties between nations and prevent wars, except it never worked, but that was their thinking. In the New World, however, it was these people who became known colloquially as quote unquote hillbillies. And I don't demean them in, in any kind of a sense of trying to offend them. I'm simply saying that's how they were popularly referred to with the high degree of inbreeding that caused low intelligence in Appalachia. Other things that happened was these were people who had feuds. The clans would fight each other. You have a famous massacre at Glencoe in Scotland between the McDonald's and the Campbell's and sort of jokes persist about it to this day. Well, the feuds came to the United States where it became the Hatfields and the McCoys of Scottish descent. These things were bought, but something else was bought from Scotland and Northern Ireland, and that is the Celtic version of Christianity, which was different than the Anglican church version of Christianity that was associated with the English. The Presbyterian lowlanders were against Bonnie Prince Charles because he was a Catholic, but the Highlanders didn't care so much about that. They were simply anti-English, and this all came to a climax at the Battle of Culloden. After that, a big immigration took place to the United States that was exasperated by the decrofting of Northern Scotland. So you had all of these transplants from Scotland and Northern Ireland, the Scotch-Irish to the United States, but their religion was Celtic. They had a Celtic version of Christianity based on the traditions of people like St. Patrick. St. Patrick was originally from Britain but became a missionary in Ireland. Now people like to point out he had the shamrock with three leaves in one plant or little plant that he used to explain the Trinity. Well, in fact, Tertullian did the same thing before Patrick with a twig with three stems. Uh, all missionaries taught the Trinity that way to pagan people. But also that St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland. Snakes were not indigenous to Ireland or Scotland. They're just not there. It's not the right environment for them to survive. It's not their habitat. There's no snakes. Now, of course, this was symbolic. Jesus referred to the corrupt religious establishment, the Sanhedrin and so forth, and Matthew 23 as a generation of vipers, a generation of snakes. St. Paul makes reference to the serpent beguiling the woman. It is Satan the seducer. What the New Testament means is a symbolic application of the nature of the serpent. Operating through corrupt religious leadership. These people, however, again, were people of low intelligence, much of it due to inbreeding. And although there were no snakes in Ireland and no snakes in Scotland, basically, they had no shortage of snakes in Kentucky. What kind of snakes do you want? Do you want cottonmouth water moccasins? Do you want timber rattlesnakes? Do you want diamond head snakes? all kinds of snakes that were poison. And so these people, primitive Baptists in certain Pentecostal sects, as they would later become, would pick up these snakes, and there's still about 150 congregations of them left in Appalachia in the United States, where picking up these snakes becomes some kind of a proof of salvation or a verification of someone's Christian faith. People did not want to be associated with this insanity. As the gospel moved westward in the great revivals that went across the United States, this became an issue and a problem. 
And with it, the text of Mark's gospel became a major issue in the United States. That was one source of this particular problem, the snake handlers of Appalachia, which still exist. Together was the consumption of poison. Now, the early Christians understood the cross of Jesus. They interpreted the Old Testament in light of the New. For instance, in Exodus 15, where the children of Israel reached the waters of Mera, meaning bitter or poison, and they could not drink them, Moses took the tree and threw the tree into the waters. The tree absorbed the poison and the bitter became sweet. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The tree was a figure of the cross of Jesus. The early Christians would have seen the cross of Jesus as the refuge in dealing with life's problems and turning the bitter into the sweet. His death, his resurrection, they would have looked to the cross. They would have understood it symbolically. Some people would understand it literally. They didn't do it so much with the poison, but they certainly did it with the snakes. The consumption of poison in the ancient world would have registered with the Greeks who knew about the forced suicide of Socrates for being a monotheist when he was forced to drink hemlock. Be that as it may, that was the sociological root and ecclesiological root of this debate in the United States concerning Mark 16. Other churches did not want to be associated with what was happening in Appalachia among these people who had a reinterpreted version of Celtic Christianity. The second was the emergence of higher criticism in the 19th century. 19th century German rationalism through institutions such as Tübingen University in Germany and the emergence of figures such as Rudolf Bultmann, who were rationalists and did not believe in the miraculous or supernatural, drew a distinction between the Jesus of faith and the Jesus of history, beginning with the presupposition that he did not walk on the water or feed the 5,000 or raise from the dead, etc. They simply tried to redeem some or find some socially redeeming value in the gospel narratives in terms of teaching principles of ethics and using religion as a means to communicate ethical principles culturally. That's what they tried to do. This was higher criticism as opposed to lower criticism. Lower criticism was always used by believers which essentially compared one scriptural text with another. It worked by textual comparison. But with higher criticism, other things came into play, such as source criticism, form criticism, etc. Let me make it simple for people with no theological background. In my generation, our understanding of horror figures came from television comedy, programs such as The Addams Family and The Monsters, in my generation when I was a kid. That, in turn, came from the classic horror films of the Wolfman and Frankenstein and Dracula with these actors who had pronounced facial features and unique vocal characteristics, such as Bela Lugosi and Lon Chaney Jr. and, and Boris Koloff. So the previous generation had these classic horror movies my generation had television comedy adaptations of it, plus pop music adaptations of it, such as Warren Zevon's Werewolves of London or the Rocky Horror Show. Somebody comes along and wants to get to the root of this. Where did these things come from? How did they really evolve? So they say, well, obviously, what you see in the pop music and what you see in television comedy came from classic Hollywood. Where did the classic Hollywood get it? They go back another strata, another level. They go back to Mary Shelley's book, Frankenstein. 
And then they go back to the history of Romania with someone called Vlad Sepish. That was the real name of Count Dracula. There actually was such a person. There is a portrait of him for which he appears to have posed, and it does not resemble Bela Lugosi. While there are bats in the Transylvania forest in the Hungarian-speaking region of Romania, the whole vampire myth and the association between Frankenstein and Dracula was invented by Hollywood scriptwriters. So, too, the idea of Frankenstein became embellished by the living dead. In Haiti, the use of curare and other toxins that could put a person into such a low pulse rate, they appeared to be deceased, but they could be animated by voodoo priests and resemble the living dead, the walking dead. Similarly, you had Jewish myths that came from the golem, someone called the golem, a sort of Jewish Frankenstein from Prague, Czechoslovakia. So you had something that actually had a historical basis. Vlad Sepish becomes Count Dracula. We know where his grave is. We know where the ruins of his castle are. It's a tourist site today. But what evolved from it was all mythologized. So, too, the living dead, the walking dead, something that actually took place in voodooism, was mythologized by Mary Shelley, the authoress of Frankenstein. But people go back to try to find what has a serious historical basis and what has a serious scientific basis or serious anthropological basis. There are medical conditions where people, both men and women, are born with the hyperproduction of facial hair and they resemble wolves. It is a medical condition. You can find pictures of people who suffer with this congenital disorder on the internet. Hence the legend of the wolfman. But you had cults that, that imitated wolves. This was called lycanthropy. In primitive tribal cultures, such as North American Indians at the time, they would put on the headdress of eagle's feathers because the chief would be in the character of a brave eagle or of the skins of a lion. The same things took place in Africa with witch doctors and sagormas, where people would imitate animals to take on the natural bravery of, 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 of animals that were known as being fierce. Well, okay, you go back and you find the real anthropology, the real science, the real history, physiology, whatever. That becomes mythologized by authors. That becomes mythologized by filmmakers, and that becomes mythologized by pop composers and television producers. But you want to go back to the origin. This was done with many things. The myth of Robin Hood being another one. There were many people like Robin Hood during the Crusades and the reign of King John and the time of Richard the Lionhearted. And there was oppression of the people that took place in England, in Yorkshire, in Nottinghamshire, and so forth. It's docufiction. It has some kind of a historical basis. But most of what we see with Friar Tuck, and there was a Friar Tuck, he was a, known as a highwayman, a robber but it becomes mythologized again by the film and television industry. So it goes, or by, by the musical theme songs of Robin Hood and his band of men. Such it becomes, such it goes. People took this way of thinking, of demythologizing, of trying to go back to the root and try to find out about the real historical Jesus, which they determined was quite different than the embellished one of the Gospels. What they were doing is taking things from, that applied in one culture and misapplying them to Scripture, saying that the Scriptures, particularly the Gospels, evolved like beads on a string. These were liberal higher critics, unsaved theologians, if you want to call them theologians. They have PhDs in theology. They were experts in a form of literary criticism that was essentially bogus. 
because they were doing things that did not apply. Now, much of their presuppositions have been debunked by archaeology. We have the Thyssen fragment of the first century. We have early um, second century copies of copies of gospel narratives. We have the reconstructions from the patristic writings of the New Testament and so forth. The manuscript and archaeological record has gone against much of the liberal presupposition to say nothing, of course, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The other issue is rabbinic scholars have looked at the gospel narratives. People like Professor Jacob Neusner, professor of Judaism Emeritus at Brown University, an Ivy League professor, or Professor David Flusser from Hebrew University, the late Professor David Flusser, or Professor uh, Pincus Lapid. These are Orthodox Jews, most of them rabbis, who've looked at the Gospels as Jewish literature and have determined that they are indeed Second Temple period Jewish literature. They were not the inventions of a Gentile church at a later time in history because the authors had too much familiarity with Second Temple period Judaism. Higher criticism is debunked. Nonetheless, it existed and it's done its damage. It came, of course, from Darwinistic thought and from Hegelian philosophy. The thesis, the antithesis, the synthesis. That's how the scriptures evolved along a Hegelian model based on Darwinist presupposition. Much the same as communism collapsed because it was based on the same Hegelian model. Marx taught that just as capitalism evolved from feudalism, communism would evolve from capitalism. And it would begin in England because England was the first industrialized capitalist country. It could never work in Russia, the last agricultural feudalistic country in Europe. What Marx said was diametrically wrong. The diametric opposite happened. It began in the last feudal country in a largely agricultural society. It did not begin in Britain, a capitalist industrialized society. It was diametrically wrong. It was based on a false presupposition of Hegelian philosophy, of Hegel's philosophy, because the science underneath it, the scientific presuppositions of Darwinism are bogus. But they built their empire on it, so the old men in the Kremlin had to keep propagating it as if it were true, even though anyone in their right mind could see that Marx was wrong. So too, these liberal, higher critical professors and so-called theologians have built their empire on this idea of textual evolution. They come up with all kinds of ideas, such as what's known as JEDP and Wellhausen's theory of Pentateuchal sources and all these things and the Jesus of history as opposed to the Jesus of faith. But the evidence is against them. The objective evidence debunks too much of what they say. Nonetheless, that is what is taught in faculties of divinity around the world. Institutions such as Princeton, which is slightly more conservative now, certainly Yale Divinity School, these places were founded by what we would today call evangelicals, by and large. But today, they're dominated by liberal faculties who don't believe. These people have gotten a hold of Mark 16 and tried to make much capital out of it. So these are the sources of the controversy. We need to put the controversy into its perspective, historically, sociologically, and intellectually. I hope I'm not boring you with the background. But now let's begin to look at the text itself. It is absolutely for sure that not until at least the fourth century were manuscripts widely produced that contained verses 9 through 20 in Mark 16. But we're talking about a time period where you had terrible persecutions by emperors like Diocletian and Decius. Not until we get to the time of Constantine does the persecutions 
really stop. And Christians are able to produce massive volumes of codexes of the gospel narratives again. But even in the age of persecution, in the first, second, and third centuries, the volume of gospel manuscripts and of New Testament manuscripts is absolutely massive and compared to anything else, we have 420 fragments of Caesar's conquest written centuries after the time of Caesar. But no one denies that Caesar crossed the Rubicon or that he was assassinated in a plot involving Brutus and Cassius and so forth. Nobody denies it, yet you have 420 manuscript fragments written much, much later, generations later after the time of Caesar. We have 10,000 of the Gospels alone of papyri and codexes, 10,000 just of the Gospels, 20,000 of the New Testaments, approximately. We even have first century fragments like the Thyssen text. Yet somehow the historicity of the New Testament becomes suspect, despite the fact that the volume of manuscript evidence for it outstrips anything from the ancient world and any civilization. And secondly, the early date of the authorship. We have something called P52, written early in the second century by people who would have known the Apostle John or would have known people who knew John, such as um, Irenaeus getting his doctrine uh, from Polycarp, who, who got his doctrine from John. Very early authoritative source material in P52, which contains large elements of John and Luke. We also have the bottom of papyrus of about 200, possibly just before 200 AD. This is to say nothing of the massive volume of New Testament citations and quotations by the pre-Nicene church fathers. Although Mark 16, 9 to 20 is not in the earliest manuscripts we have, they were still cited by both Justin Martyr around 140, 150 AD and by Irenaeus early in the second century who got his doctrine from Polycarp, who got it from John. They knew about these passages and have written that they knew about them, even though Eusebius tells us they were not included in the earliest manuscripts. Additionally, all the way ahead to the eighth century with the Islamic invasions, Christian libraries in Lebanon and elsewhere were burned. The Muslims destroyed many of the best Christian manuscripts, certainly those that were in Aramaic or taken from Greek and put into Syriac. It's not to say it never existed. It is just to say it is not in the manuscript history we have it now, but we have patristic attestation that Jesus said and taught these things. In other words, although it may not be there, Although it may not have been included at the end of Mark 16, and there's arguments to say it probably wasn't, that does not mean it is not canonical or that Jesus never taught it. In addition to the patristic attestation, there's something called the Q hypothesis, which I personally do not believe. The Q hypothesis says that the Synoptic Gospels Matthew, Luke, and Mark, or certainly Matthew and Luke, had a common source called Q. I do not believe the Q hypothesis. There's no manuscript evidence of its existence. However, I do believe that the gospel authors were familiar with each other. Hence, there is nothing in Mark 16, virtually, that cannot be justified on the basis of other scripture, particularly what's in the other Gospels. Although we have terms not normally used by Mark, such as Lord Jesus, 
it is a Pauline term. There's something called Mark and priority, the belief that Mark wrote at the dictation of Peter and it's the oldest gospel. And again, there is a lot of evidence to support this theory. Some people almost accept that as fact, and I don't say that they're wrong. But it was not characteristic of Mark to say, Lord Jesus. It was certainly characteristic of Paul, however. The Lord Jesus, I'm speaking now in Hebrew, but it has a Greek equivalent in Yesu Kurios. Uh, there's about nearly 20 terms in Mark that you don't find elsewhere in Mark that are at the end of chapter 16, but they are not hapex legemini. In other words, they are found other places largely in the New Testament and even in the Gospels. Let's look at some of this. Mark 16, verse 9. You have an abrupt ending in verse 8 that does not seem to make sense and may account for the later interpolation of verses 9 through 20. But in Mark 16, verse 9, it comes from Luke 18, verses 1 to 3. Verse 10 of Mark 16 comes from John chapter 20, verse 18. Verse 12 of Mark 16 comes from Luke 24 verses 13 to 32. Verse 13 of Mark 16 comes from Luke 24 verse 14. Verse 14 of Mark 16 comes from Luke 24 36 to 38. And verse 15 is almost straight out of Matthew 28 19. These things are there. The problem becomes the tongues, the poison, and the serpent. However, when Jesus sends the apostles out in Matthew 10, they do cast out demons, etc. A serpent bites Paul. In Acts 28, following the shipwreck at Malta and is shaken into the fire. Obviously, it is a for a picture of what would take place in the book of Revelation as prophesied, the serpent that is Satan being cast into hell. It has a typological meaning, although the event has historicity and it did happen. Now again, the early Christians would have understood serpents, we're told from uh, Second Corinthians, as spiritual seduction, as Satan the deceiver working through false teachers and so forth and a corrupt religious leadership. But it literally did happen in Acts 28. Additionally, we are told that the Exodus motif of Exodus 15 happened as an object lesson and a teaching lesson for Christians, according to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 through 11. It has meaning for Christians. When they couldn't drink the waters of Merah, until the tree was thrown in, the early Christians would have understood it. There is nothing in Mark 16 that cannot be justified elsewhere on the basis of the teaching of Scripture. Higher critics have attempted to make the same arguments as we said in the past with John chapter 8, verses 1 to 10, the woman caught in adultery because most manuscripts do not contain it. It is a higher critical argument. Let's go to the lower critical argument, interpreting scripture in light of scripture and emphasizing Sitzimnaben. That is the Jewish culture of the second temple period. We know that this would have taken place against the background of Simcha Torah, the joy of the Torah, immediately following the Simcha Beta Shoiva celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7 where Jesus would give the living water a figure of the Holy Spirit. The joy of the Torah was that there would be a salvation from the Messiah who would fulfill the law. Jesus writes with his finger on the ground. Now remember, in John chapter 7, we read about the living water. We are told the Messiah, then, is the fountain of this living water 
the Holy Spirit. But this is straight from the book of Jeremiah. We read the following. In chapter 2 of Jeremiah, my people, that is Israel and the Jews, would reject the Messiah, the fountain of living water, in verse 13. And in Jeremiah chapter 17, we see that all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away on earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living water. Those who reject the Messiah, who'd give the Holy Spirit, their names would be written down on the earth. In John 7, immediately preceding John 8, and there's no chapter division in the original Greek canon, you see the fountain of living water is Jesus. Those who reject him, their names are written down. Let he who was without sin cast the first stone, and they reject him. They walk away one at a time in direct fulfillment of Jeremiah 17, verse 13. Those who turn away on the earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living water. Lower critically, there's no problem with John chapter 8, verses 1 to 10. Only higher critically. So too, lower critically, there is no problem with Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. Only higher critically, the pseudo-theology of non-believers that is often not even rational because it is misapplying the procedures that they developed to try to get to the source of ancient myths from one culture and misapply it to another. Some of them have actually used Eskimo myths from Greenland and trying to get to the source of those Eskimo myths and apply those procedures to the scriptures. It's pseudo-intellectual folly. This is higher criticism. I mentioned briefly Wellhausen's theory of Pentateuchal sources. They say there were four versions of the Torah, one of which was the priestly that came from Babylon. Wait a minute. After the Jews returned from Babylon, there was a low interest in anything priestly or Levitical. Haggai railed against the people for their disinterest in rebuilding the temple and reinstituting sacrifice, as did Ezra and Nehemiah. There was no priestly interest. Why would this have been produced in Babylon? Not only that, but the post-captivity biblical literature, Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and so forth, contain Aramisms, Aramaic words or grammatical constructions, but you have no Aramisms in the Torah, in the book of Genesis. It is bogus theology, bogus scholarship. This is higher criticism. They are like the old men in the Kremlin. They built their empire on a myth. Everybody knows that communism did not begin in England. It began in Russia, where it never could have happened according to Marx's Hegelian model. Higher criticism is the same. They have built their reputations on a myth. What needs to be demythologized is not the word of God or the historicity of the gospel accounts. What needs to be demythologized is higher criticism. Once more, I am not saying that the original manuscript or the original autographs necessarily contain the verses 9 through 20 from Mark 16. I'm not saying that. There is abundant evidence to suggest that was not the case. What I am saying is, it still has historicity. Jesus did teach those things. Those same things, lower critically, are found in other scripture. Although it may not have been in the original manuscript autograph, may not have been, we cannot be 100% sure it wasn't, but may not have been, I would even concede probably wasn't. That is not to say it did not historically happen. 
That is not to say Jesus never taught it. And that is not the same as saying, therefore, that it is not canonical. I hope this answers the question. Thank you so much. My name is Jacob Prash coming to you this week from Israel. God bless.